morning's gospel lesson is about a mountaintop moment in the life of Jesus' disciples. I invite you to think about a mountaintop moment in your own life, a high point in your life when it just felt really good to be alive. It could be a big experience or a small experience. When I think about the mountaintop moments in my own life, I think about my college graduation, my daughter's first birthday, my first date with my husband. I also think about ordinary times spent together with family and friends when my heart felt especially full. We also experience mountaintop moments in our spiritual lives. Last fall, I spent a Sabbath day hiking Mount Watatic. As I hiked, I prayed, and when I got to the mountaintop, I stayed for a long time, just basking in the beauty of being alive in the presence of creation and the creator. It was a deeply spiritually renewing time for me. Last week in our confirmation class, we had a conversation about the role that tradition plays in our faith. And we were asked to name our favorite church traditions. And for me, immediately, my mind envisioned one of my favorite mountaintop moments in the church year, Christmas Eve service, when we all hold small glistening candles in our hands and the church is filled with the rich sounds of voices singing Silent Night and the collective glow of our candles lights up the darkened room. There's nothing like it. The Bible gives a special name to the mountaintop moment that takes place in Luke chapter 9. The experience is entitled the Transfiguration. That's why today, in addition to being Scout Sunday, it's Transfiguration Sunday. As Kylie read so beautifully for us just a few minutes ago, the Transfiguration involves Jesus strapping on his hiking boots and inviting a few of the disciples to join him for a climb up the local mountain. When they reach the summit, Jesus begins to pray. And while he is praying, the scriptures tell us that his appearance changes. His clothes fade from the color of dirt and sweat stains to the color of freshly fallen snow. Jesus is transfigured. Now, in our culture, the word transfigure is not one we use very often. At least, it's not a word that I use very often. However, the meaning of the word transfigure is not hard to understand. According to my trusty friend, Google, the word transfigure means to transform into something more beautiful or elevated. So you could say that the snow that fell on Friday transfigured the city of Lemonster, covering our houses and streets in a sparkling white blanket. The snow transformed the city into a more beautiful city. Over the centuries, numerous artists have attempted to depict the transfiguration of Jesus. I'm going to show you a few of them. So this first one is by artists Robert Smirk and Jean-Marie Delot, and it dates back to 18th century England. All right, here's another one. This depiction of the transfiguration is by an Italian artist called Angelico, and it's from the 15th century. 
And now here is a more contemporary interpretation. This one is part of an art project from 1973 entitled Jesus Mafa, and it was created by a Christian community in Cameroon, Africa. And one more, this last one is actually anonymous. It's been done by a graffiti artist on the side of a building in San Francisco, California. If the disciples had carried iPhones in their tunics and been able to capture the moment of Jesus' transfiguration in a photograph, who knows what it would have looked like. Maybe there would have been glitter or fireworks. Maybe everybody would have broken into Handel's Hallelujah Chorus. Whatever it looked like, the transfiguration was a moment when Jesus' appearance was transformed into something more glorious than just your average first century Jewish guy. And the disciples were able to see that not only was Jesus human, but he was also God. The Bible does not give us a lot of details about Jesus' transfiguration. But what the Bible does tell us is how one of the disciples responds. Peter, who is totally the teacher's pet of the disciples, decides that it would be appropriate to interrupt this mystical mountaintop moment with just some running commentary from his own brilliant mind. So he says to Jesus, teacher, it is good for us to be here. Let us build a dwelling right here on top of this mountain so that we can stay in this moment of glory. Let's construct a shelter, a bathroom, a kitchen, some beds up here so that we don't have to leave. Let's build a house right here on top of this mountain so that every day can be Transfiguration Sunday because this is where we belong. Oh, Peter, first of all, dude, you're not a contractor. And second, you just don't get it. Here Jesus is giving you this incredible gift to glimpse the glory of the living God. And all you can do is say, hey, boys, let's launch a construction project. Let's do some development up here on this mountaintop. Peter doesn't get it. But let me stop myself before I go too far down the rabbit hole of Peter's buffoonery. Perhaps I, perhaps we, could look at our own selves and consider if we ever make a similar mistake to Peter. How often do we miss the mountaintop moments, miss the point of the mountaintop moments in life that God gives us? How often do we misunderstand the purpose of our spirituality, our religion, our faith? Do we ever imagine that church is an end in itself? That the construction of spiritual mountaintop moments like the one that I described on Christmas Eve is the church's, the church's highest purpose. Of course, mountaintop moments are important. God knows that we as humans need to have experiences where our everyday lives are transfigured. And where we can glimpse just how beautiful life really is. Just how connected we are, tr we all truly are. Just how glorious it is to be in relationship with ourselves, with one another, and with God. Mountaintop moments matter. But we run into trouble when we try to build dwelling places on top of those mountains. 
What do I mean by that? Well, have you ever had a spiritual experience, maybe in nature, maybe on some sort of a retreat, maybe in a worship setting, only to return to your everyday life afterward and find it dissatisfying? Have you ever visited or seen on TV a larger, fancier church where everything just seemed perfect and then translated that one-time experience into trying or even just wishing to replicate an aspect of it in our own very normal, very unpolished, very down-to-earth church? Did you feel frustrated? Have you ever found yourself pouring all of your energy into maintaining and improving the church as an institution or as a building? All so that what? Why? So that we can enjoy nice worship services and attract more people to come and join our nice worship services? Have you ever heard yourself say or think something along the lines of, if the church could just get more people to come inside our building, then they would see how wonderful the church really is, and then they would stay. Have you ever found yourself thinking life and faith would be a whole lot easier if you and God could just get away from all of the other annoying people trying to hold you back? I know I have on all of those things. Are you trying to build a dwelling place on the mountaintop. When I first read this morning's gospel lesson, I found myself wondering why the reading doesn't stop with the story of the transfiguration. Why does it continue with this seemingly unrelated story in the next few verses about Jesus casting out a demon? How are these two episodes connected? Why do they go together? Verses 37 and 38 read, On the next day, when they had come down from the mountain, when they had come down from the mountain, a great crowd met him. Just then a man from the crowd shouted, Teacher, I beg you to look at my son. He is my only child. And he goes on. The trouble with mountaintops is that no matter how wonderful they are, we always have to come down. A mountaintop isn't a mountaintop if there isn't a valley somewhere close by. The reason why the mysterious transfiguration story is juxtaposed with this odd description of a boy possessed by a bad spirit is that mountaintop moments are not an end in themselves. Mountaintop moments exist. Jesus clearly does not feel like it. If you didn't catch in the scripture what I'm talking about, I invite you to go home and read this story again for yourself because it is hilarious how much Jesus is clearly not in the mood to be working. But nevertheless, verses 42b and 43 tell us that Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the boy, and gave him back to his father, and all were astounded at the greatness of God. On the mountaintop, Peter and the disciples were astounded at the greatness of God. But in the valley, a great crowd of people were astounded at the greatness of God. Mountaintop moments, beloved, are always meant to lead us back down into the valley so that transfiguration can occur not only before our eyes, but before the eyes of the world around us. A few weeks ago, I visited 
the Cub Scout meeting on a Monday night to train them for their acolyte duties for today. And I led the boys in a long line slash herd down from the fellowship hall to the sanctuary. And when we walked inside and I flipped on all the lights, one of the boys, I don't know who it was, gasped and he said, wow, it's so beautiful. I get that reaction to our sanctuary a lot when people see it for the first time. It is beautiful in here. And I was touched and I was grateful that a child noticed. But what that boy probably already knew, and what I as an adult need to remember, is that a beautiful sanctuary is not an end in itself. A great worship service whatever you think information in the world around us. Our world has plenty of opportunities for mountaintop moments, most of which are far more spectacular than our lovely sanctuary. No offense. Our world also has an abundance of amazing charitable causes. But what our world is lacking, the unique, and vital resource that faith offers is the integration of mountaintop and valley, the synthesis of contemplation and action, the cycle of being transformed and then participating in the work of transformation out in the world. The rhythmic way of being that requires us to go up the mountain and then back down again and up the mountain, and then back down again. Or as we like to call it in the church, being a Christian, following Christ. If you think back to the story of the Wemmicks in the storybook, what makes Lucia different is that she goes up the hill to visit the maker every day. So that the other Wemmicks can see how she is different. The practice that begins to transform Punchinello's life is the practice of going up the hill to visit the maker. He goes up, and then he goes back down. And that's when a dot falls off. And it makes all the difference in the world. Amen. This morning, Christ invites you into the rhythmic life of being a Christian, following Christ. If you're stuck in the valley and you need some time on the mountain, Christ invites you to follow him up. If you've been on the mountaintop and now you're trying to build a home up there, Christ invites you to follow him back down into the valley if you simply need to spend more time with your maker, your maker is waiting. If you want to follow Christ this morning, whether for the first time or the 10,000th time, now is the time to do that. If you're ready, you can take the first step right here, right now. All you have to do is say to God in these next few moments of quietness and reflection, God, I'm ready. And then after the service, put your feet where your heart is and follow through. Make a plan to go to Bible study and learn the rhythm of contemplation and action. Make a plan to roll up your sleeves and serve. Make a plan to follow Christ up the mountain and then back down. Up the mountain and then back down.